Jason Krantz set his career path at age 12 when he learned that he could make more money in his lawn mowing business by hiring other kids to mow the lawns. After a stint at McKinsey in the late 90s, he went to Harvard Business School and graduated at the height of the dot-com boom as founder and CEO of Infinata, an information services company. Unlike most companies founded at that time, Infinata survived and was ultimately sold. At Definitive Healthcare, Jason has led the company through a decade of growth with an emphasis on healthcare commercial intelligence. In this episode of the Health Biz Podcast, Jason describes the trajectory of the company and emphasizes the critical importance of culture, especially as the company grows from the tens to the high hundreds of employees and goes public, as Definitive recently did. In his spare time, Jason has been reading David Nassau's book about Andrew Carnegie, America's original titan. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps companies like Definitive Healthcare develop robust growth plans. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. Well, Jason Krantz, CEO of Definitive Healthcare, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks. Appreciate you having me. You know, when I hear something's going to be definitive, that's a lot more definite than what we usually have here. But we'll, uh, we'll, I'll try to, I'll try to couch your assertions to the proper, uh, the proper discount if we need to. But I want to hear a little bit about your kind of your, your background, your, your upbringing, um, and sort of any, you know, early, early influences that stuck with you from childhood. Sure. So I, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, so a long ways from where I am right now. And, you know, I think I had from the very beginning, I always had interest in being an entrepreneur and starting my own business. I was uh, I had a lawn mowing business when I was 12 and I quickly realized I could make more money if I hired my friends to mow the lawns for me. And I just became the uh, the front man. So, so that was the kickoff to my career. You know, I was influenced by by a lot of people. Um, you know, coaches growing up throughout the year. My father was a, a small business owner as well. So I think that entrepreneurship, uh, that entrepreneurial spirit was instilled in me very early on. Now on the coaching side, did you, did you play sports or what kind of coaches are we talking about? I did. Yeah, I played a bunch of sports growing up. So athletics was a big part of my life growing up. Any particular uh, sport? You know, I noticed that sometimes depending on what sport uh, somebody was in, it can have an influence. Like, for example, my brother, was a wrestler and you're sort of out there on the mat on your own. And I think it's helped him as a physician and he works in a rural area where he's sort of in charge and has to be able to handle anything that comes at him. You know, there's not like a, a team as part of it, but you also have to understand, you know, who you're right. working with. So I don't know if you had any particular experiences or was more just kind of the amalgamation of the various ones. You know, I always liked team sports better. So I played baseball and basketball growing up, uh, played football for a little bit as well. Uh, but the, the, aspect of team sports that I love is you only win when everybody is performing together. And I think there, that, that camaraderie that goes along with that and that culture of, you know, what actually makes a winning team. It's, it's not all driven by the coaches, it's driven by the people is something I've tried to bring into the business world as well. So you had the lawn mowing, got people there. What did you decide to do in terms of your education? What'd you do for, uh, for undergraduate and where'd you go after that? Yeah, so I went to Boston College. Uh, so that's how I ended up out in the East Coast. And after I graduated from Boston College, I got a job at McKinsey and Company doing strategic consulting. And, and that was really an important job for me in terms of determining what I was going to do the rest of my life. Uh, you're, you're around some amazingly smart people. You get exposure very quickly to uh, CEOs and other leaders across different industries. Uh, but my role as an analyst, I spent a lot of time analyzing data. So we would we'd go into our clients, we'd pull down all of the information on their customers, transactions with those customers, and we'd spend a lot of late nights crunching that data and trying to find insight that could change their business. And, and we would. Uh, we'd find some amazing insight uh, that people hadn't seen before. Uh, so that, that carried over into what I've done my entire career. Uh, so after McKinsey, I went back to Harvard Business School and actually, uh, in my second year of Harvard, which was the year 2000, uh, the internet was exploding and everybody was starting a business and figuring out how to get on the, the dot-com boom. And I was no exception there. So 
I started a company in 2000 called Infinata uh, while I was still in school. And the concept of Infinata originally was to take information. It was an enterprise software product. And we would take information from our clients on their customers and how they interact with their customers, pull it into an online software and allow them to do sophisticated, you know, almost McKinsey and company type analytics, data analytics that they could then distribute throughout their organization to make better business decisions. Oh, so very it. early kind of business intelligence type stuff. Uh, it was a good idea. And we took off, we, we signed our first six figure client before we graduated. I uh, raised a small seed round of financing. Uh, and as good as 2000 was to start a business, the next four years were, were very difficult. Uh, so what we found is customers love the idea of our software and they love the idea of being able to do rapid analytics on a self-service basis. Uh, but they were very nervous about giving us their proprietary data and thinking that we might not make it as a company because uh, so many companies were going out of business during those years. Uh, so what we did is we pivoted a little bit. And we said, let's take our software and let's start collecting our own information. Uh, so at the time, uh, still now, life sciences is, um, you know, really growing, exciting market. So we started collecting information on every biotech and pharmaceutical company across the globe with a focus on the clinical trials and investigational drugs that they were performing. We pulled this into software we already created and we started selling subscriptions back to the industry so people could understand uh, where were the new technologies being developed and who was partnering to create those? Uh, and that, that and we bootstrapped the company and we built it up to a, a fantastic company that I sold in 2007 to the Financial Times Group. Uh, terrific. We were talking before the show about uh, Harvard Business School around that era because I'm a graduate from 94 and my wife from class of 95. So we're back there for the reunion. And I think people had thought, you know, Y2K was something that was going to happen on uh, New Year's Eve. But actually, the whole uh, meltdown happened uh, some months later. But it was it was pretty heady times uh, during your graduation. You know, as you said, a lot of the companies that uh, were started in those in those boom times or were just sort of coming out of it, they kind of collapsed. And Infinata, even though you started it at, at that moment, you actually did sustain it, keep it going, as you said, and really pivot and, and build. And I, I think that's sort of the key to, you know, the key to being successful. It's great to have uh, terrific timing, but also to, you know, figure out how you how you swing with things as, as they shift. You know? well, that's right. I, I think what I found is you, you learn the most during the difficult times. It, it's easy to grow a business when things are going good and all tides are rising. Uh, but some things that I learned during that period that I've tried to carry forward is uh, capital efficiency incredibly important? So cash is king, obviously, uh, but building businesses where you can um, evolve them quickly and you don't need large amounts of capital to generate and grow them over time uh, is something that that I hold uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, also, the ability to attract and retain great people. Uh, this is this is something that is critical to every business, and you really learn it at a moment like that where the world's falling apart around you and being able to figure out ways to uh, motivate employees to continue on and fight through the difficult times uh, is something that I think is a great lesson that you learned during that time. You know, when you have those down periods or those challenging periods uh, within the, in the business, you talk about, uh, you know, motivating the, those employees and, and keeping them on board. I think there may be maybe some opportunities to apply that lesson on a larger scale right now with the sort of the great resignation that even in you know boom times a lot of opportunities uh you know during this this particular era uh, a lot of people are you know are questioning their you know the continued participation even in, even in the labor force but did any of those lessons that you learned in, in, in those sort of times apply now would you say they they've always applied but i think you're right they're they're even more important today when there's such a tight labor market and there's so many options for people uh, what we really focus on at a company, and we really have since the beginning, is creating a great culture uh, where people want to be here for a lot of different reasons. And uh, a few of the reasons that I think are incredibly important is, you know, yes, there needs to be a great culture. It needs to be enjoyable and collaborative and all of those things. Uh, but some things I think that make uh, Definitive a little bit more unique is uh, we really like to challenge people. So we want, we're solving interesting problems in the healthcare industry, which has its challenges. So 
people want to be part of solving these problems and be part of uh, something bigger than just the company that they work for. And we provide that opportunity. We, we push people to challenge themselves and think about problems in new ways. Uh, and we're helping our clients transform healthcare. And that, that's really important to people. Uh, and then the second thing that we do that I think is particularly unique is we have a huge focus on giving back to the community. Uh, so we launched in five years ago, a program called Definitive Cares. And it was really a grassroots effort. The idea originally was how do we, a few employees were coming to us and saying, hey, can I take some time off of work to go volunteer? And of course we said, yeah, that's a great idea. But then we started thinking about how can we, how can we grow this and make it part of who we are as a company? So we started a small steering group to start to identify volunteering opportunities for our employees. And what we quickly realized though, is we were doing it all wrong. This is not about me finding volunteer opportunities. It's about empowering our employees to go work with organizations that they're incredibly passionate about and figure out ways to um, to create opportunities for the rest of the employees to give their time and their energy to these important organizations. Uh, and that's been great. We've had 100% participation four years in a row. Uh, last year was challenging with, you know, the inability to do anything in person, but we still hit 100% participation. We got really creative. Yeah. Uh, but it's yeah. those things that, that create a culture that's special. And, you know, we've been a best place to work five years in a row. And that's what retains people at the end of the day. Um, it's that culture and that tie to who we are as an organization. Now, after, you know, the Infinata sale, it looks like you had various board and advisory roles. And then how, what was your path sort of from there, you know, on to Definitive? Yeah, so I spent a couple of years transitioning to the new owner. Uh, I took a little time off to figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, I knew I wanted to start a data business. I, I love data businesses. I love solving difficult problems. Um, I think the impact of using data well is so important on all industries. Uh, and then I, I always loved healthcare and really for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, healthcare is a big industry. It's a $4 trillion industry, 20% of the US GDP. Uh, so I like playing in a, a big pond to start. Uh, then you think about the complexity of healthcare. Healthcare has so many different participants that all want something different. So you have, uh, you have the physicians who are providing care. You have patients who want to get care. You have health insurance companies and governments that are paying for the care. They all have different motivations. So understanding the healthcare market and navigating it is incredibly complex. So there is big problems to solve, which, which I completely appreciated um, and something that got me excited. And then, and then, as I alluded to before, you know, as you think about how you spend your time as you get older, uh, you want to do things that are impactful uh, beyond just, you know, creating a great business. Yes, we've created a fantastic business that's growing fast, uh, but we're having real impact as well on the healthcare world. You know, our clients are the ones that are increasing quality and driving down cost in healthcare and identifying new life-saving therapeutics. And, and we're a key part of helping them do that more efficiently. So it's been about, you know, a decade or so. And, uh, you know, it's funny with healthcare, you think about the size of the, the industry. And I've been in it for, for a long time. And I remember when people said two trillion, it sounded pretty big, then three, and now I guess four is the number. I saw something today that said that the healthcare industry, the healthcare industry is bigger than the uh, the US the government, which is saying something. So um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's different ways to put that in, in perspective. Those are some pretty large- Both those metrics are scary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't know what comes in third, but um, what have you seen in terms of the major kind of, you know, evolution in the company and then in the ecosystem over the past, let's say, decade? And then we'll talk about maybe the, the most recent uh, time period. Yeah, let, let me start with the, the ecosystem. Uh, so much has been changing in healthcare, and I think that change is accelerating. And, and it really has to. There's, there's challenges. It's a big market. It's expensive. You know, as you compare us to the world, we have we do many things great. We innovate incredibly well, uh, but you know it's a very costly system. Access to healthcare is a problem, uh, so there's a lot of a lot of challenges that the ecosystem has. Uh, but what's been changing over the last ten years are things like uh, there's been an explosion of data. So electronic health records are collecting more information, which really started you know in earnest 10, 12 years ago. So there's a lot more information that can be utilized to develop drugs faster or 
uh, be more efficient in the way that we provide healthcare. That that's very important. Uh, there's been this interesting fragmentation of how healthcare is delivered. Uh, so it's no longer you immediately just go to your hospital, your emergency room. Uh, you have urgent care clinics. You have surgery centers. Uh, you have telemedicine, which exploded uh, as a result of COVID. We we measured something like fifteen thousand percent increase yeah. in telemedicine visits in April of last year of 2020. Uh, so there, the, there's this change in the fragmentation of how healthcare is delivered that will continue to evolve uh, because we as consumers demand it. We want more convenient, uh, less costly healthcare over time. So that's an important trend as well. Uh, but then at the same time, you have this consolidation of healthcare, uh, which is uh, the, the power of healthcare is consolidated into fewer people. So big health systems that are uh, want to make sure that they can keep patients within their system uh, because that's the best way that they can control quality and cost as as they take on more of that more of that liability for uh, making sure that they provide healthcare at a reasonable cost. Uh, so a lot of big changes that have been happening, and those are accelerating. Regulations are continuing to come into the market that are changing it, uh, and all of those trends, you know, for definitive healthcare are, are good. We help our clients understand this market, navigate changes as they happen. Uh, so telemedicine is a great example. Uh, we were able to, within about a month of time when this exploded, we were able to take our data scientists, point them at a whole variety of data we already had and figure out, uh, they created a telemedicine propensity score. And what this did is it told our clients which providers were adopting telemedicine today and most likely to adopt it in the near term. Uh, so they're able to understand as these changes take, pl take place, how does that impact the community overall and the providers that they're serving? Uh, so that's the ecosystem. And then, I mean, definitive has been, yeah, it's been a change after change after change. And next year will be more change. Uh, so we, you know, as a company, that, that change is what we're all about, where we innovate extremely quickly, uh, both in terms of bringing products to market that are disrupting healthcare. Uh, but also internally, we, we change all the time. We try to innovate to run more efficiently. Uh, so, you know, as a, as a CEO, it's been really interesting. You, you found a company and you know everything that's going on in that company. I mean, everything that changed in the first four years in the company, I had a part of in some way. And then all of a sudden you hit, you know, 100 people. And what I realized at 100 people is you need to start to delegate and find great people that can go run their part of the organization. And that's incredibly hard to do as a founder because you're so close to everything. Uh, so we had to make that change at about a hundred people. And, and what was great is then I think I've got it all figured out. Like, all right, everything's running smooth again. And then you get to 200 people and it starts again because those people now need to delegate to the next level down and, and so on and so forth. And now, you know, we're 700 people strong and growing. Uh, we'll add, you know, 150 probably people over the next year or so. And what becomes incredibly important then is alignment of the entire organization. So uh, coming up with a clear strategic vision of what's important to the company, what we're focused on, and sometimes more importantly, what we're not focused on. So, so what do you eliminate and not have distract the organization? Uh, so you get that strategic alignment, you build really important metrics that everybody understands and agrees upon. Uh, and that's really how you run the business then is you, once you've set that vision, you've set those metrics, then you let the amazing people that we've hired, these 700 people uh, that are so passionate about what they do. If, if we all agree on where we're going, nothing gets in our way and we're, we're able to accomplish things much more quickly than anyone else. Well, it sounds like you were paying attention at HPS to, in your strategy and organizational behavior and finance and other classes, not, not just not just dreaming of dot com riches. Either that or you learned it pretty well uh, along the way. It, it is interesting, um, you know, to be on top of all the data and then be able to see how things are uh, evolving. You pick up a lot of interesting things going on in the healthcare system. And back in 2000, it's the first time we started to work on, you know, what's called the web visit, doctor patient web based communications. The potential has been there for a long time and it took certain uh, events to kind of to trigger it. And then what you're talking about in, in terms of the ecosystem with the both the 
you know, fragmentation of care, but then also the kind of amalgamation into these big systems, which are partly there to serve the patient and partly there to battle against the uh, the payers on the one side and the providers on the on the other. And there's there's a lot uh, that you can map out uh, from there. So I want to ask you about this concept that I saw you touting on healthcare commercial intelligence. What does that mean? You know, and who is that really aimed at? Yeah, so healthcare and commercial intelligence is all about helping our clients navigate, analyze, and sell into and compete better within the healthcare vertical. Uh, so as I talked, as we both talked about, this is a big market and it's incredibly complicated. So if, if you want to compete in this market, if you want to sell effectively to healthcare providers, uh, or you're a healthcare provider trying to build out a better network uh, or reduce patient leakage, uh, you need to understand this entire ecosystem. Uh, and you need to understand how the providers all link together and their, their very complex relationships between them. And, and that's what healthcare commercial intelligence is all about. It's about uh, creating the information and the data science on top of that to help our clients understand this vast market and if they want to sell into it, if they have a therapeutic that they're trying to sell, you know, they need to understand where are those patients and who are the providers that care for those patients and, and who are the physicians that, that influence those providers. The interconnectedness of the entire industry uh, makes very specific healthcare intelligence incredibly important if you want to be successful within this market. Yeah, there's a lot going on clearly in terms of understanding the influences and how to, for a company to be successful. Uh, commercially. And so there's been a real revolution in data on that side and analytics that you're you're helping to drive. There's a whole heck of a lot going on at other levels within healthcare. And if you think about, um, you know, really the evolution of things like real world data, real world evidence uh, on the clinical side, it's become quite, um, quite prominent now. And you see hot profile companies like, you know, Datavant uh, recently announcing a $7 billion uh, deal there, making a lot of mm -hmm. noise and, and all sorts of players now feeding their information into the ecosystem. Is that a parallel um, kind of a, a universe or how does it interrelate with what you're doing on the commercial intelligence side? It, it, it's overlapping in parallel at the same time. So we, we will, we tap into some similar data, um, you know, on the clinical side, as you think about the clinical world, a lot of real world evidence is about uh, figuring out how can you how can you develop drugs more quickly, for example, by using data. So can you take cycles out of the, the drug development process that's very expensive and very lengthy uh, by using historical information to essentially um, guess at what you think is going to happen? And, and again, short circuit the cycles a little bit. Uh, we, we overlap a little bit in the clinical area. We help our clients uh, within pharmaceutical and medical device we help them figure out uh, site selection, for example. So who are the, where are the best sites in order to make sure that they're able to attract and uh, attract the different patients that they need, the patient populations that they need in order to run an effective clinical trial. Uh, we help them think about, uh, we have a database of 11 million global experts. So experts across the world who uh, might have expertise within a particular disease area or even more specifically, a mutation within a disease. There's very specific experts out there. And these people are absolutely critical to connect to these pharma companies as they're developing uh, new drug trial protocols. Uh, and as they bring a drug to market, uh, helping to explain to the market why it's a better standard of care and why it will help the patient uh, better than what is out there today. Uh, so there is some overlap within there, but, you know, it's a very, very big market and we'll, we'll continue to expand the data sources that we have and the sophisticated analytics that we put onto it to keep solving more and more business problems for our clients. You know, everything looks pretty clear in your kind of career and in life and in, uh, in retrospect, at least as we've, you know, just described it, you've grown uh, definitive after having experience with Infinata, you were at HBS at the right time and kept your head uh, on your shoulders. You were at McKinsey, you had the lawn mowing, you learned from your coaches uh, and so on. So any clairvoyance for the next uh, few years as it relates to definitive and your own uh, career progression? Yeah, well, you know, as you know, we just IPO'd in September. So I really see that as, thank you, appreciate it. Uh, it was very exciting, uh, kind of entrepreneur's dream. But I really see that as a just a step in the journey. 
Uh, we we have big aspirations as a company, so we we think we could be a billion dollar revenue company over time, and and really be the franchise player that is going to tra- help our clients transform healthcare. Uh, so there's a lot of work to do, a lot of wood to chop on that. Uh, so we'll continue to uh, build out more sophisticated analytics. We will uh, we've developed this proprietary set of data over the last ten years by pulling in information from hundreds of thousands of sources and using really smart data science to link it together and cleanse it and create new information. And now it's all about how do we keep building onto that and you know deepen that competitive mode and solve more problems for our clients. So that's bolting on new data and that's applying even more sophisticated data analytics and data science to that information. Uh, so there's a lot to do. Uh, the U.S. market is it's an enormous market. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for us to continue to grow. Uh, so that's what we're focused on is, you know, how do we keep finding opportunity, hire great people to go capitalize that opportunity uh, and keep building a company, you know, something with a culture that I can be proud of. That sounds uh, sounds good. I look forward to uh, the next podcast a couple of years down the road. We can uh, check check those boxes off and see how smoothly it went. Now, uh, final question. It sounds like you've been uh, certainly pretty busy uh, over the last, you know, quite a while. But are there any, uh, have you had a chance to read any books? And is there anything that you would uh, recommend, either on the business side or just uh, pleasure? Yeah, good question. Uh, I do try to find time to read books. Uh, It's been a little harder recently, but uh, I do find some time. So just thinking about, you know, some more business books. So I do my beach reading, of course, but uh, the books that people might be more interested here. Uh, I really liked, there's a biography of Andrew Carnegie, um, which I'm not sure if you read that by NASA. Uh, fantastic book. It's this great story of, you know, a pretty tough steel baron who completely changed over and starts figuring out, you know, how do I, how do I give away all of my money during my lifetime and have real impact on the world around me? Um, and I just think it's a really great message uh, for, you know, lots of people who have come into a significant amount of wealth of how, how do you impact the world and, and make sure that you can use that wealth in an appropriate way. Excellent. Well, Jason Krantz, CEO of Definitive Healthcare, thank you for joining me today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.